Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you have probably heard by now, SpaceX have suffered an incredibly rare failure of a Falcon 9 rocket, a rocket which has been incredibly reliable. It's made over 300 launches without any incidents. This, this is also the Block 5, and I don't think we've had any incidences where payloads were not delivered to orbit by a Block 5. We've certainly had failures in the past. Think of like CRS-7 and AMOS, which was, you know, earlier versions of the Falcon 9. Those never made it to orbit. We had booster recovery failures, but this is the first failure in a very long time where a payload may not make it to its target orbit as a result of a launch vehicle failure. So this is Starlink Group 9-3 out of Vandenberg, California. It's another batch of 20 Starlink satellites being launched on a reusable booster. And the first stage went absolutely fine. That booster is flight proven and I think we know that this actually is a good thing. The second stage is of course fresh. It is brand new. This engine has only gone through basic testing. This is the thing that is going to suffer the problem. So on the right side, what we see here is an engineering camera looking down. There's a pair of them on each side. We can see the large engine bell extension growing red hot. Above that, you can see the silver you know, reflective mylar thermal insulation that blocks out the thermal radiation that is coming from the sun and from that engine bell because the top of the engine is dealing with cryogenic propellants and you want it to remain cool for your know, operational reasons. Now, normally when we're looking down, it's actually quite common to see little pieces of ice fall down and sit just above the top of that engine bell. That um, that tube that runs around the outside here on, of the engine, that is what is injecting the film cooling gas, right? Where you inject cooler gas that runs along the outside to protect this. And it's quite common to see little pieces of ice fall down into the and sit in here. You see like that there? But in this flight, the amount of ice that starts getting produced is way beyond anything we've seen before. So the ice can come from things like, uh, you know, water, humidity that has come in through the, you know, through the system as it's sitting on the ground. Vandenberg was very foggy. But in this case, look, it starts inflating up. That looks to me like something failed inside there and we're starting to leak one of the propellants into this cavity and it's basically expanding slowly. Now, it's probably liquid oxygen. As the liquid oxygen expands and in the vacuum, it evaporates and as you have something evaporate in physics, it cools the liquid underneath it. This is called leaving the, the latent heat of vaporization is used to expand, you know, evaporate the oxygen and that leaves, takes heat away from the oxygen underneath, which eventually solidifies and forms this ice. So we can see huge amounts of this coming in and falling off the rocket. And that to me says, yes, we've got an engine failure of some sort. You can see these pieces falling down and getting smashed as they hit into that high energy exhaust. And it really is quite a mesmerizing piece of footage. I'm glad we got to see it, uh, except that I'm sad that it destroyed the rocket. Um, by the way, on the left side, there's uh, some cameras that have uh, what looks like a piece of insulation involved. Some people think that it may have uh, be related to the problem on the second stage. See that insulation there? I don't think that's a problem, but it could well be we'll have an investigation to find out. So look, that engine on the right, it is operating fine. There is a small leak, but clearly when they go to relight the engine later, that's when they had the problem and the engine fails to start, it explodes. I don't know if they've got footage of this. I would love to see it if they do. So with the Starlink Group 9, what they've been doing is launching the satellite or the second stage into an eccentric orbit originally, right? So they launch it into an orbit with a perigee of about 135 kilometers, that's the closest point to the Earth, and an apogee of over 300 kilometers. And the, the idea is then they wait 45 minutes and then they relight the engine and that circularizes the orbit before dropping the satellites off. And they probably do this because it's the most efficient way of doing this, right? If you actually look at the altitude on the right, initially they go up a little and then they actually start losing a bit of altitude because they've optimized their launch trajectory to be able to launch the maximum amount of mass possible. 
they do this because you know they want to fit the most satellites on there if they could do this and put the satellites into a higher orbit they probably would but this is what their most efficient orbit is so the satellites are in orbit what's the problem well the problem is that they're on an eccentric orbit and their low point passes brings them down into thicker parts of the admittedly very tenuous atmosphere while this is a vacuum as far as we human bodies are concerned um, these satellites are actually going to be feeling a small amount of atmospheric drag. And it is, yeah, very, very tiny amount of atmospheric drag. Normally, a satellite with a thruster system can attempt to overcome this and raise the orbit up. That's great. The Starlink satellites have onboard thrusters for orbit maintenance. But their thrusters are amazingly efficient argon Hall effect thrusters. That is, Hall effect thrusters using argon. They get fabulous lifetime, great on-orbit performance, but their thrust is weaker than a mouse fart. So, yeah, that's not great. According to Elon, they apparently uploaded special new software to make the thrusters work more, you know, generate more thrust. I'm not sure if they're dumping in excess argon and they're getting something like a resistojet or an arc jet kind of performance. Uh, but... I, he says it's it's like warp nine in Star Trek, but it's probably not going to work because this isn't Star Trek. So yeah, uh, at this time, the Space Force have cataloged a number of these objects in orbit. It's not clear, but Jonathan McDowell thinks that some of them may have successfully raised an orbit, but it's not clear that all of them are going to succeed. Um, we might have a whole bunch falling back. So anyway, from now, what we've got is that SpaceX is going to have to perform a, a mishap investigation because the second stage, you know, ha is left in orbit, could fall down anywhere. They would like to know what goes on. I sort of naively thought that, hey, you know, SpaceX might want to continue flying with Starlinks to collect more data and after all, not risking their own payload. But something like Polaris Dawn, where they're launching, you know, Jared Isaacman, they might want to wait a little until they understand what went wrong with this. But uh, a statement by the FAA says, our return to flight is based on the FAA determining the system process or procedure related to the mishap does not affect public safety. So it sounds like there is going to be a temporary grounding and it's not clear if SpaceX is going to be able to argue that it can lift that grounding for certain classes of mission. Um, Having said that, even if SpaceX does manage to argue with its amazing statistics that it's had, you know, hundreds of successes, and this really is a rare anomaly, it's still possible that customers might want to hold back until a full investigation happens. This is, of course, you know, this kind of mishap, this kind of grounding of a rocket is exactly why the U.S. wants to have diverse launch systems. It wants to have SpaceX. It wants to have ULA Firefly, Rocket Lab, Blue Origin. It wants to have as many launch systems as possible so that during investigations, they can mix and match, they can keep things going without worrying too much about everything draw drawing to a halt. So, you know, as of right now, yeah, that does sound like it's going to leave a big Starlink-shaped hole in the launch schedule. We were going to have, um, you know, Polaris Dawn launching in a few weeks, five, four, three weeks, I don't know, four, four weeks, three weeks. Yeah, it's not going to happen now. Almost certainly that's going to be delayed. Although, to be fair, if they did have a second stage failure like this, uh, they would have been fine because they only used the thing once. <laughs> so it wouldn't actually be that bad for humans flying on a rocket. But if it was a bigger leak, right, if that engine failed partway through the burn, that would be an abort scenario. So, you know, you've got to understand these problems before you go forwards and continue launching high-value payloads on them. This is also something, you know, I, I also note that this failure to relight the engine is amazingly similar to what happened to Ariane 6 just a few days previously. What are the odds of that? Now, in that case, Ariane 6, they have absolutely delivered their payloads to their target orbits with the exception of the re-entry capsule. So that is, that is definitely more success than failure. And this one, I think what we can do is count how many Starlinks actually make it to orbit and judge how much of a success or failure happens there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.